Great. So welcome, everyone. My name is Emily Manns. I'm the Executive Director of Preservation New Jersey. And we've had a bit of a break from our Q&A with PNJs. This is a initiative we started in July 2020. Um, we took a little bit of the fall off and we're so excited to be getting started again uh, with our speaker today, Stephanie Hoagland. I'll just quickly share my screen with you. Here I went to the client. One more. Oops. Just make sure you mute, uh, mute yourself. Uh, so uh, Stephanie is um, a member of our Building Industry Network. So we're particularly <laughs> excited to have her today. And I'm just going to read a little bit um, of her bio before we get started with her presentation. So Stephanie is a principal and architectural conservator with Jablonski Building Conservation, where she's been employed since 2003. Now, Stephanie was first introduced to the architecture of the Wildwoods when she interned for the Duwap Preservation League in the summer of 2001. She then completed her graduate school thesis on the conservation of 1950s and 60s concrete motels in the Wildwoods. After graduation, she worked at Arch 2 in Metuchen, where she assisted in the completion of the nomination forms for the Wildwood Shore Resort Historic District and the motels of the Wildwoods multiple property listing. Stephanie has worked in a variety of conservation projects throughout the US and Canada, including finishes, investigations, conditions assessments, and hands-on conservation treatments. Uh, but this is really one of her passions from the, uh, that early work in the Wildwoods this is a presentation she is really excited to share with us today. Um, we love people to connect during our Q&A with PNJ, but we also want to leave time for this really exciting uh, long, uh, long form presentation. So if you would love to drop your name and the organization you're associated with in the chat, just so we can kind of see who's in the room with us today, that would be wonderful. Um, we will be going through the presentation without questions, but then at the end, we'll have uh, a time period for about five minutes for question and answer. And then Stephanie is volunteered to stay on the call even longer um, to you know, have a discussion and answer any questions at the end. Um, so with that, I'm gonna let Stephanie take it away. And uh, yeah, please introduce yourself in the chat. Thanks, thanks Taylor for getting us started. All right, I'm gonna spotlight you. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, is that, can you see the slide? Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, as a quick introduction, this presentation is a revamp of a paper originally presented to the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training for their conference on roadside architecture. Uh, my biggest disappointment with that talk was that only 20 minutes, I didn't have enough time to showcase all the great motels. And now that we have twice as much time, I'm really hoping that you'll end up leaving uh, here loving the motels of the Wildwoods as much as I do. Um, in the early 2000s, the Wildwoods were home to an amazing collection of 1950s and 60s motels. The New Jersey Historic Preservation Office had issued their opinion and stressed their excitement about the prospect of having the collection listed on the state and national register. This push for designation was being led by several local motel owners and it all seemed to be in the bag. But today there is no doo-wop historic district. So after appearing poised for preservation success, how and why did this grassroots movement fail? So we're gonna start with a little bit of history. Collectively known as the Wildwood, can everyone mute themselves? All right, thanks. Um, collectively known as the Wildwoods, the resort is comprised of three separate municipalities, North Wildwood, Wildwood, and Wildwood Crest. They're located on a six mile long barrier island near the southern tip of the state off exit four of the Garden State Parkway. The history of these cities mirrors that of many American seaside resort towns. They were founded between 1880 and 1905 by land developers who saw the island as a great location for a summer resort. The name Wildwood was given uh, to the communities by one of the developers in honor of the dense twisted forest growth that covered the island at the time of their founding. The history of the growth of the Wildwoods was slow until the introduction of reliable railroad service in 1889. These trains brought visitors from nearby Philadelphia, but also from areas further afield, such as Connecticut and New York City. 
In an attempt to compete with other New Jersey city, other New Jersey resorts such as Atlantic City, each town built their own boardwalks and amusement pavilions. These early boardwalks were made of individual planks set directly on the sand, which could be removed at the end of the season or to avoid destruction from storms or high tides. In 1900, the Borough of Wildwood built its first permanent boardwalk. And since the beach was and still is in a state of accretion, the boardwalk was moved further east and improved in 1905, 1911, and 1921. The boardwalk, along with the amusement piers, contributed to the resort's popularity and the towns continued to grow through the 1920s. To house these visitors, hotels began to pop up a length the length of the island, ranging in size from boarding houses with just a few rooms to larger hotels seen here. Although some of these hotels catered to a higher class of customer, the majority of the visitors were middle and working class patrons from Philadelphia who were drawn in by the specials and affordable rates these establishments offered. Like many resort communities, the Wildwood struggled through the depression and in an effort to attract customers, the resort focused on offering special events and attractions to boost business, such as baby parades and fishing regattas. The Miss America beauty pageant was even held in Wildwood in 1932 after it was halted in Atlantic City for being too immoral. The end of World War II brought with it the end of rationing which when combined with the increases in leisure time and disposable income, allowed families more time for vacations. The Wildwoods Publicity Department began an aggressive campaign to promote the resort, which brought an increase in the number of visitors to the island nearly every season. During the July 4th holiday in 1952, officials counted almost 300,000 visitors who arrived in about 50,000 automobiles. This increase in car traffic led to the Wildwoods Sorry, this increase in car traffic to the Wildwoods required a change in how visitors were housed. In an effort to keep up with the need for accommodations, the resort saw a boom of new motel construction. Part of the attraction of the motel was the casual atmosphere and park at the door convenience, not found in stuffy hotels. There was also the liberation from the requirements of tipping bellboys and desk clerks, easy access, free parking, no reservations required, and personal privacy. Motel construction in the Wildwoods began in earnest in the late 1940s. The first motels, such as the Sun Deck and the Shipahoy seen here, were designed like apartment units. These motels were primarily two-story rectangular boxes and lacked many of the amenities that would be seen later, such as swimming pools and on-site parking. The term motel did not come into popular use until the 1950s. The earliest motels had such names as cottages, courts, lodges, and apartments. E.H. Lightfoot, an architect with the Tourist Court Journal, stressed the motel owners should avoid whimsy and aim for a more modern aesthetic. He recommended that they be built of stucco with a sanded finish, using simple lines, and be painted pure white. These early 1950s motels were often linear, with the office located near the center of the property. Here you're looking at uh, four different postcards of early court style motels in the Wildwoods. As you can see, the builders of these motels stuck really close to those rules put forth by Mr. Lightfoot. And while most of these motels have since been demolished, a quick Google Uthview did find that the Lantern Lane is still in business and just as adorable. Perhaps the greatest boost to the resort was the opening of the Garden State Parkway in 1955, which runs vertically along the length of the state. Upon its completion, it was estimated that the parkway would bring between an addition would bring an additional 349,000 cars to the Wildwoods each season. During this time, the Wildwoods continued to attract big name entertainers. Wildwood's amusement piers became surrounded by bars, nightclubs, and supper clubs, all featuring entertainment. In October 1955, a Newark newspaper reported that entertainment booking agents had begun to refer to the Wildwoods as Little Las Vegas. By the end of the 1950s, Wildwood ranked second only to Las Vegas in terms of both quantity and quality of the entertainment it offered. Wildwood saw many rock and roll firsts. Rock Around the Clock was first performed on Memorial Day weekend in 1954 at the Hofbrau Hotel in Wildwood by Bill Haley and his Comets. 
The song's status as one of the first rock and roll hits has given rise to the city's claim as the birthplace of rock and roll. During the summer of 1957, Dick Clark held record hops at the Starlight Ballroom in Wildwood, and the first national broadcast of Dick Clark's American Bandstand was aired live on ABC TV on August 5th, 1957. Chubby Checker's dance craze The Twist was introduced at the Rainbow Supper Room in July 1960, a month before he performed it on American Bandstand and launched a national craze. The mid to late 1950s saw not only an increase in the number of motels being built on the island, but also a change in style. These new motels were attracting families by offering amenities such as playgrounds, ping pong tables, kitchenettes, and miniature golf. They were often two stories in height, L-shape in plan, and set back into the property line. The always present pool was tucked into the crook of the L with pull-in parking, one for each unit along the street. Many of these new motels were modeled after designs seen in Florida. They were inspired by the glamorous post-war resort hotels designed by Morris Lapidus, who worked to combine the images of luxury and opulence with the strict budget guidelines set by owners. The Wildwood motels were built relatively inexpensively and then heavily embellished. The owners worked to bring that high style architecture seen in Florida down to an everyman's level. These motels were truly vernacular structures in that they took progressive designs and constructed them in traditional materials. Many of the most fantastical motels, such as the Tahiti, the Chateau Bleu, and the Ebb Tide, were constructed of simple concrete block and then used wood framing to create the modern appendages, such as butterfly roofs, angled walls, and port cochers that matched the stylistic designs conjured by the exotic names of the motels. Between 1956 and 1964, over 200 motels were built on the island. Much of what made these motels so visually stimulating were the embellishments, the superfluous decoration that gave each individual motel a sense of place on an island filled with hundreds of other motels identical in body and plan. The embellishments could include wonderful neon signage, often perched on the roof to be clearly seen from the street, colorful lighting around the pool, decorated soffits under the balconies, and even the plaques displaying the room numbers which match the theme of the motel. It was this ornamentation that attracted the visitor and his family and made them want to return year after year. Each of these details worked to support the theme of the motel and enabled the visitor to imagine they were visiting places they would not normally have been able to afford. The lava rocks, tiki's, and grass thatch umbrellas at the Waikiki transported you to a tropical paradise. While the five-story pagoda and Asian-inspired garden walkway at the Singapore could whisk a family away to the Orient. Today, we classify many of these motels as doo-wop, which is a term coined by the Mid-Atlantic Center for the Arts in the early 1990s to describe the unique space age architectural style that was common in the 50s and 60s. This architecture incorporated modern sweeping angles, bright colors, starbursts, boomerang shapes, and angular walls and roof lines, and is also known as googie or populux. The Duop Preservation League has come up with a list of eight different styles of duop architecture found in the wildwoods. Early duop, modern blast off, broom, Polynesian, phony colony, shore thing, Chinatown revival, and far out. So next up, I'm going to show a couple examples of each different style. Early duop essentially describes early mid-century modern architecture. These motels were forerunners to the full-blown duop style. If you look closely, these two motels are very similar. Both are two-story L-shaped motels with prominent balconies. The Seacove Motel set its level part using vertical glass block and cast stone on its street side facade. It also used a modern, very 1950s color scheme at the rooms. The Flamingo Terrace Motel, the postcard at the bottom, is a classic example of how a motel changes over time. Obscured behind the tree is a Victorian era home that had been used as a boarding house in the early 1900s. And here's a later image with the tree removed where you can see that older build boarding house. And as motels became more popular, they built this uh, structure adjacent. And then in the 1960s, an additional two-story wing was constructed and a swimming pool was added at the rear. 
As the owner of these motels also often ran the motel, they needed a place to live and their living quarters often became a fanciful feature of the motels. The first motel to actually call itself a motel was Jay's Motel, which opened in 1952. This motel was constructed by Will and Lou Morey, who together built a large number of the motels on the island and really helped to shape the architectural style of the Wildwoods. The Morey family often vacationed in Florida and brought back the styles they saw and applied them to their own motels. Jay's was originally a one-story L-shaped structure which wrapped around the owner's home. The design of these rooms had a very modern flair, as you can see in the detail at the lower right, with its cantilevered overhanging eaves, vertical fluorescent lighting installed between the windows. Like many Wildwood motels, as business grew, a second story was added, which doubled its capacity. While some motels made their second story simpler, which would make them more ex less expensive, Jay's replicated those decorative elements from the first floor right down to the vertical lights between the windows. This second story addition was so well designed that when initially surveying this motel, I didn't really realize that the second story was an addition until I saw that historic postcard from the previous slide. For some reason, this is one of my favorite motels in Wildwood. It just looks so quaint. The Breezy Corner was the second motel constructed in Wildwood Crest, which was a latecomer to the motel trade. Zoning laws in the municipality forbade the construction of motels and records show that many residents wanted it kept as a bedroom community rather than a haven for quote, unmarried couples and wayward teenagers. Eventually businessmen began to put pressure on the town commissioners and the zoning was changed in 1954. As you can see from the date of construction, they wasted no time in getting these new motels open. Although constructed two years after Jay's Motel, the breezy corner is nearly identical to Jay's, including the brick windowsills, unsupported overhanging eaves, and vertical fluorescent lights between the windows. This motel is unusual in that while it is still an L-shaped motel, the entrance for one ring um, opens directly to the sidewalk instead of opening into the center courtyard. As these motels were constructed prior to the widespread use of air conditioners, the window and wood screen doors were louvered, which would allow a refreshing breeze to flow through the room, especially at night after the sunset, while still retaining privacy. The next theme is modern blast off. These motels encompass futuristic architectural interpretations inspired by the jet and atomic age. Think the Jetsons. Upon its completion in 1956, the Caribbean Motel was among the most imaginative structures to be built in the Wildwoods during that era of post-World War II optimism when everyone had one eye on the future and the other on dreams of exotic vacation destinations. Just by looking at this motel, you can tell that it is impossible not to have a good time at the Caribbean. The exterior sports ultra-modern architectural elements like a futuristic levitating ramp to nowhere, cantilevered glass walls, and staggered recessed spaceship lights along the roof and balcony trim. This theme was ramped up with exotic landscaping when the uh, Caribbean imported the very first plastic palm tree to be planted in the Wildwoods. While being interviewed for an article on Wildwood for Smithsonian Magazine, the author asked me, how can you tell the real trees from the fake? And my response was, the real ones are dead. They just can't handle these Northeast winters. Plastic palm trees have become the official tree of the Wildwoods and are formally known as Palmus Plasticus Wildwood Eye. The top image is a detail of that futuristic uh, circular ramp, which leads from the horseshoe shaped pool up to the sun deck upstairs. The lounge off the game room features angered glass walls that tilt in near, this, uh, near the middle and then angle out towards the roof line and is really one of my favorite design features of the motel. The Bel Air, constructed in 1957, remains a doo-wop gem along Ocean Avenue. This motel is a deviation of the L-shaped motel in that the northern wing is angled to form a seven, which you can see in the image at the upper right. While I was looking for an aerial image of the motel to show its distinct shape, I noticed an interesting architectural feature. When you look at the aerial image, you'll notice that the angled theme extends through three different motels on two adjoining blocks. And while at first I thought this was just a quirky feature known only to the architect, it turns out that it's actually a remnant of the old streetscape, which was set on the diagonal following the old coastline before the most recent street grid was laid. 
So both the Bel Air and the Caribbean were originally beachfront properties. Other modern characteristics of the Bel Air included the large glass windows, the overhanging prow roof, and the design of the railings, which looked like an electrical current also known as hairpin. Many of the motels constructed in the 1950s were modeled after hotels seen in Florida, especially Miami Beach, which featured Florida styling, including stucco walls, jalousy or louvered windows, and baths finished in ceramic tile. Upon its completion in 1968, the Satellite Motel was advertised as the Motel of Tomorrow. While the basic plan of the building is similar to many on the island, a two-story, two and three-story concrete block motel with a regular pool at the center, the motel sets itself apart by its boomerang roof and space age imagery. The large wing at the front held the living owner, the owner's living quarters and a lounge which opened up to the sun deck. The angled shape of the roof is repeated in the balcony railings and at the individual rooms, which sported triangular windows and wood siding applied at a 45 degree angle. As you can see, the design of this motel is very much of its time. Room style motels are defined by forward jutting and pointed architecture featuring angled walls and balconies. The Ebb Tide is another Maury Brothers motel and is considered to be their most trend setting. The most remarkable feature of this motel was the leaning walls, meant to suggest the ebb and flow of the ocean tides. The two-story glass cube housing the office was constructed in 1958 and served as a combination lounge, playroom, and TV room at a time when many people didn't have televisions at home. Now notice the configuration of the motel at the rendering at the upper left, since we'll be coming back to that on the next slide. Here you can see how the motel grew over time, adding a second and then a third story while retaining that angled architectural style. The stucco walls of the first floor lean back at about a 65 degree angle, while the walls of the second and third floor lean forward. Like many of the fantastical architectural features found on the motels of the Wildwoods, these angles were produced by smoke and mirrors. While the exterior gave the building the look of concrete, the walls were actually wood framed layered over concrete block walls. The Maury Brothers angled wall design was repeated on several other motels found on the island, including the Garden Manor and the Sea Winds Motel. Both of these are smaller, simpler versions of the ebb tide created by smaller mom and pop motels. The Rio is another example of a motel showing movement through angled walls. While the walls of the ebb tide angle in and out, the walls of the Rio are staggered and turned on the diagonal. In addition to being visually interesting, this feature also provided every room with a beach view. Over time, multiple additions were added to the Rio. The early additions included rooms with large angled glass pane windows, while later additions were more economical with simple straight lines. Those additions were built to bring in cash, not make a statement. The next is Polynesian, which consists of tiki-inspired architecture featuring thatched roofs, tiki heads, and torches. One of the most unusual motels in the Wildwoods was the Casa Bahama, completed in 1959. Contractor Mike Branca intended the motel to invoke images of the South Seas. The most striking architectural feature was a series of A-frame false fronts clad in wood shingles. Were they intended to look like a row of two-story huts, to me they always kind of looked like a Swiss chalet. The Casa Bahama was the first of several Polynesian pop or tiki style motels to be built in the Wildwoods. The architectural style's origin dates back to 1934 when a small tiki bar was opened in Hollywood, which was quickly followed by other restaurants such as Trader Vic's. The style really took off after the end of World War II, when many GIs returned home after stints in the South Pacific. In Wildwood, the Polynesian theme became very popular for drawing in tourists. In terms of theme follow through, the Tahiti may be one of the best. Although the basic plan of the motel is a two-story L-shaped building constructed of concrete block, faux beams, thatched roofs, notched rafters, and large projecting gables decorated to suggest uh, Polynesian huts made this a visual wonder. At night, the motel would come alive as tiki torches surrounding the pool were lit, bathing the motel in a golden light. As you can see in the bottom image, who needs to go to the South Seas when you can just go to Wildwood? 
Billed as a touch of Polynesian on the Jersey Shore, the Kona Kai Motel, completed in 1968, was one of three tiki-themed hotels built by the Mori brothers. Using the usual concrete block and precast concrete units, the Moris added a two-story lava rock wall, tiki torches, tiki heads, and a small tropical garden to push the tiki theme to the extreme. Another Mori Brothers motel, the Waikiki, featured lava rocks and thatched roofs supported by bamboo poles. In the mid to late 1960s, a second round of intense motel construction occurred in Wildwood Crest. By this time, the accretion of sand on the beach had gotten to the point that the city was able to plot the land to the east, adding an entire block of new beachfront property and Ocean Avenue. Unfortunately, that meant that if your lot had been situated along Atlantic Avenue, such as the Bel Air and the Caribbean, you were now a block away from the shore. This forced many motel owners to either move their signage from along Atlantic or add additional, more outrageous signage along Ocean. The Waikiki is an excellent example of the late 1960s motel construction that popped up east of Ocean Avenue. These motels were often four or five stories tall and linear. While the older motels could fit three or even four buildings on a block, these new motels encompassed the entire block, ensuring Ocean Avenue access and direct views to the beach. Note that the rooms of the Waikiki are angled to ensure that every room gets that water view. Next up is Shore Thing. This theme includes architecture that evokes tropical, exotic, or nautical themes related to the beach. To fit into this category, you really could take any style of motel and add beach words and a really neat sign. But some motels still made sure that they included modern details, such as the coral sands at the bottom right, which in addition to angled rooms also had an angled roof, causing this motel to also fall under the category of the room designation. Phony colonial motels contained colonial themed architecture featuring red brick facades, cupolas, or turreted crowned roofs. The category also included motels with an American patriotic theme. With its brick veneer, colonial revival columns, stars and striped signage, and cupolas that served no function, you can't get more phony colony than the carriage stop motel. The details extended to the rooms, which exhibited bay windows and paneled wood doors with faux wood iron straps. And oh yeah, don't forget those fake gas lamps. The Cape Cod Motel is an example of how a theme doesn't even really need to be followed through to get into a certain category. You just need an awesome sign. Wildwood Crest has about 10 versions of this same motel. The office is located in a cute Cape Cod house and the sign in which the name of the motel in neon rotates around the base of a lighthouse is situated at the top of the motel, but other than that, this motel is pretty plain. After this sign went up, the city of Wildwood Crest decided that the rotating sign was a little too much and enacted a ban on rotating signs, making this one of only two on the island. As discussed before, motels can fall into multiple categories. While the signage for this motel is phony colony, these are room balconies. If you look closely, you'll see that the edge of the second and third story balconies angle in and out. Unfortunately, when they added the fourth floor, they kind of took the easy way out with a boring straight edge, but they did angle the room so they can charge more for that beach view. Chinatown Revival are those motels, which consist of Asian inspired architecture. These motels often incorporated pagodas, pavilions, thatched roofs, and Chinese script in the signage. The Singapore Motel is a classic example of Chinatown revival and is one of Wildwood's most unique structures. If not already evident, this is another Mori built motel. Aladdin Color Inc. of Wildwood produced postcards for a large number of the motels on the island, including these stunning images. In addition to the Pagoda Temple, which housed the offices and temple suites, the motel had curved support beams, a Zen garden, Asian-inspired railings, and large windows for each room angled south to ensure, once again, a beach view for every visitor. Unfortunately, the Singapore is right now a little bit confused. The top photograph I took in about 2004 and while dark, the colors found on the building were reminiscent of Asian temples and the perimeter fence had Chinese characters interspersed with panels decorated in a pebble finish. 
The original Asian inspired wood railings stressed horizontality, which is a mainstay of Asian architecture. When I returned in 2006, we found a brightly colored mishmash of styles. The large ocean facing rooms had been replaced by French doors, the wood railing had been replaced by white vertical metal railings to meet code, and the Zen garden had been covered in concrete. A 2001 Google Earth image shows that all character and visual interests have been stripped away from the exterior. Far out is often a catch-all category for all the strongly themed and or brightly colored architecture and include imagery of medieval knights, jungle safari, Grecian, Aztec, you name it. The Lollipop Motel, constructed in 1959, is an example where paint and signage turn an ordinary motel extraordinary. The building is once again a simple three-story L-shaped cast creek concrete block motel, but the brightly painted doors and iconic signage make the lollipop one of the many favorites on the island. Now I'll give you one guess as to who built this motel, and if you guessed the Mori brothers, you are correct. This motel is named after the Morris Lapidus Design Motel in Hotel designed in Miami. Although this motel in no way resembles the Eden Rock in Florida, the name alone is enough to make you want to stay there. And the couple in this car thought their stay was great. The Eden Rock features some elements seen in other motels, including the angled wood soffits, which are decorated with staggering lights, linear railings, and large picture windows. It also boasts Wildwood's only true kidney-shaped pool. Now you can't have a good duop motel in the Wildwoods without a neon sign. The large number of motels on the island were able to keep multiple sign companies in business, including Allied Sign Company, Ace Signs, ABS, and Lanza, all located in Wildwood. ABS Signs designed a lot of the original signage and is still active in restoring much of the neon on the island. While each municipality has their own ordinance regarding size, brightness, and movement, all now allow neon in some form. In a town where most of the motels are equidistant from the beach, offer the same amenities, and have nearly identical room plans and layouts, flashy signage was one way to draw customers to your motel day or night, such as these examples of the Alley Kai and the Bel, Bel Air. Here are the pink champagne, which is truly one of my favorite signs, and the Isle of Capri with its classic 1950s font. Doo-wop architecture was not limited to just motels. It could also include retail stores, restaurants, and shops along the boardwalk. The upper left image is of the Surfside Restaurant, which opened for business July 4th, 1963. The restaurant is nearly circular in plan with five angled walls encompassing the eating area. The walls are primarily large sheets of glass, which project up to the proud roof, which tops each wall. The fantastic roof was exposed at the interior, freely displaying the steel beams and wood rafters that supported it. Like the satellite motel, Schumann's restaurant, later named Hudson's, was constructed by the Mori brothers and uses that same boomerang roof found on the adjacent structure. The Nut Hut at the lower left is one of many stores on the boardwalk that utilize neons and fantastic signage to attract customers. Through the 1960s, the number of visitors to the island continued to grow, and it was estimated that the Wildwoods were entertaining as many as 2 million people a year. And even though new motels were continuously being built, virtually every motel on the island had its no vacancy sign switched on daily. But the late 1960s saw an increase in crime rates and rowdy behavior on the island. Robberies, assaults, fights, and even murder were giving the resort a bad reputation. Media coverage of ocean pollution and water contamination caused many visitors to search for vacation spots that did not involve the Jersey Shore. It was also haunted by competition from larger amusement parks such as Disney World and Six Flags. The legalization of gambling in Atlantic City brought with it the construction of large showy casinos that attracted both the big name entertainers and the crowds who flocked to see their shows, leaving the Wildwoods with second and third rate acts, disco, and the likes of David Cassidy. The gas crisis and economic downturn of the 1970s further injured the resort, and by 1990, the city of Wildwood had an unemployment rate of 19%, the highest on the South Jersey Shore. 
27% of the city's permanent residents were living below the poverty level. As a summer resort, the island never developed an industrial base and was dependent upon a tourist economy that only lasted from May to September. Throughout the remainder of the 1970s to the mid-1990s, businesses in the Wildwood remained slow, and this commercial inactivity led to a preservation by neglect of the motels. Starting in the late 1990s, the Wildwood saw a resurgence in popularity. Its collection of 1950s and 60s architecture was unlike that found anywhere else in America, and it began to att attract academic and media attention from many different sources. In 1997, the Society for Commercial Archaeology, which is devoted to the building, artifacts, structures, signs, and symbols of the 20th century commercial landscape, held their 20th anniversary and annual conference in the Wildwoods. The island was also host to several architecture, planning, and preservation studios from the University of Pennsylvania, Kent State, and Yale. Part of this newfound popularity was due to the creation of the Duwap Preservation League, which was founded in 1997 and whose mission was to, quote, foster awareness, appreciation, and education of the popular culture and imagery of the 1950s and 60s and to promote the preservation of the largest collection of mid-century resort architecture found in the United States. They were able to get national magazines, such as Preservation Magazine and Smithsonian, to include cover articles on the architecture. U.S. News and World Report called Wildwood must-see Americana, while USA Today called a drive down Ocean Avenue a drive through beach blanket bingo territory. Bringing attention to the island's collection of mid-century modern architecture was just one part of a multi-pronged effort to attract visitors, extend the annual tourist season beyond September, and revitalize the local economy. Extensive redevelopment in the island's boardwalks and piers was completed, including the construction of a new convention center to attract programming and visitors in the off-season. Wildwood was staking its economic future on the success of Duwap. City planners continued to work to promote the island's unique architecture resource and extend the doo-wop theme to other new design elements, such as pedestrian boulevards, street signs, and signage. In an effort to get new development to follow the doo-wop theme, architects developed a handbook of design guidelines entitled How to Doo-wop, which laid out the doo-wop vision and provided instructions on rehabilitating existing structures and how to incorporate new construction into the context of the existing architecture. The city of Wildwood adopted this guidebook in its development ordinance to enhance the community in much the same way that Miami Beach adopted Art Deco as the theme for their community. The turn of the 21st century brought the beginnings of a real estate bubble and developers began taking an interest in properties on the island with the aim of demolishing the motels and constructing modern condominiums and townhouses. Jack Morey, son of Will Morey, motel owner and co-founder and then president of the Duwap Preservation League, was concerned about the recent demolition and began working with the cultural resource management company Arch2 out of Metuchen about the issue of historic preservation and to see if the motels would be eligible for protection. They understood that the first step would be a survey of the relevant properties. And this is where I come in. Over the summer of 2001, I was hired as an intern to survey over 300 commercial structures on the island. Arch2 redesigned the survey form to include criteria specific to the motels, such as lobby location and description, swimming pool location and shape, decorative motifs, signage, and balcony design, including documenting the shape of the eaves, edges, and railing. After graduation, I was hired by Arch2, and over the course of the next year and a half, we researched the histories of both the island and the evolution of the motel, completed the nomination forms, and defined the historic district boundaries. With a large number of mom and pop motels, no chain stores, and its beachside location, the Wildwoods has a distinct sense of place and an authentic identity. Being there was like being nowhere else in America. As the motels on the island essentially formed a time capsule of mid-century modern resort architecture, all of those involved in the creation of the nominations felt that it would be a slam dunk. Unfortunately, its unique character continued to attract developers eager to cash in on the island's newfound popularity. 
While the architectural historians were frantically researching and writing, more motels were being lost. Modern innocuous condos with faux Victorian details and clad in vinyl siding continued to pop up all over the island. At the lower right, you can see how at three to six stories high, many of these new condos dwarfed the motels they surrounded. The 1950s, sorry, the 1950s and 60s motels also tended to be clustered with other motels of similar size, which allowed clean straight sight lines to the neon signage often perched on the roof. On the lower two images, you can see how these taller condos now obscured that rooftop signage, making them difficult to read. Additionally, plans were put forward proposing the construction of several high-rise condo hotels. At, at 25 stories, these buildings would have knocked the Ferris wheel off the list as the tallest structure on the island. On April 8, 2003, the draft nominations were submitted to the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office, which included a multiple property listing entitled Motels of the Wildwoods and the submission for the Wildwood Shore Resort Historic District shown here in red, which encompassed 43 blocks in Wildwood Crest and the city of Wildwood. The proposed demolition of the captain's table, a beachside restaurant from the early 1960s to make way for proposed mid-rise condominium brought the urgency of a proposed historic district to the forefront. On July 23, 2003, the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office issued their opinion that the historic district was eligible for listing on the New Jersey and National Register of Historic Places. They also determined that the captain's table was a contributing resource to the historic district and that replacing the one-story restaurant with a seven-story condominium would have an adverse effect on the district. Representatives from the Duwap Preservation League and Arch 2 continued to meet with motel owners and other members of the community to express the importance of the collection of motels, to explain the process of designation and to clarify what the creation of a historic district meant for the motel owners in terms of what they could and could not do with their property. As a lack of continued maintenance meant that a number of the motels were a bit worse for wear, the availability of tax credits to assist in upgrades and restorations was emphasized. The economic benefits of heritage tourism were also discussed using Cape May and its collection of Victorian era homes as an example of a neighboring blighted community that had been made vibrant through the use of historic preservation. While it seemed like many motel owners were excited about the idea of doo-wop, when the developers showed up offering twice what a motel owner thought their property was worth, they were still ready to sell. Between 2003 and 2006, an additional 50 duop motels were demolished to make way for generic condominium development. Losses included some of the most iconic motels on the island, including the Ebb Tide, the Satellite, and the Rio Motel. This continued demolition put the duop motels on the National Trust list of America's 11 most endangered historic places for 2006. The loss of the motels required updates to the inventory, reevaluations of the boundaries for the historic district, and the resubmittal of the nomination forms to the Historic Preservation Office, which had even created a notated map of the island, observing each demolition and unsympathetic alteration. The last push for a historic district came between 2005 and 2006 with revised boundaries, which reduced the size of the district by an additional 20 blocks. The minutes from a Wildwood Crest Town Hall meeting regarding the designation showed a contentious assembly. Even after multiple attempts to educate motel owners regarding regulation, multiple statements made indicated a lack of understanding of what it meant to be listed on the state and national register. The owner of the Hialeah Motel even went so far as to state, I think I'm being raped of what I deserve. Needless to say, the Hialeah met the fate of the wrecking ball later that year. By the end of 2006, the economic downturn slowed the rate of demolition, and many hoped that it would help preserve some of the remaining motels by allowing time to educate the public on the importance of preservation. Unfortunately, by this time, the Historic Preservation Office felt that the integrity of the area had fallen below the point of creating a cohesive historic district. Time moved forward, and the idea of creating a historic district had essentially been put to bed. Over the years, I've gone back to the Wildwoods, and each visit revealed the loss of additional authentic structures. 
the recent uptick in the economy has brought about the revival of additional demolition. When I went back last February of our February 2018 for the NCPTT paper, I found that of the 319 structures originally surveyed, 121 had been demolished. Of the 198 remaining motels, at least 43 had been converted to condominiums. These condo conversions can be just as destructive as demolition with heavy alterations, including replacement of railings, doors, and windows, the addition of a story or two, the elimination of mid-century modern decorative details, the addition of vinyl siding, property name changes, and the removal of signage. Here you can see what used to be the Flying Dutchman. As originally constructed, it was a two-story flat-roofed motel as seen in the upper image. Today, it's a three-story peaked roof structure which looked nothing like the building it used to be. The bones may remain, but the skin has been removed. While this wholesale elimination of entire blocks of historic motels is painful to anyone who appreciates their kitschy atmosphere and connection to the past, the question remains, has the loss of these motels had an economic effect or had an effect on the economy of the Wildwoods? And the answer is a resounding no. Since 2010, the number of tourists to the island and visitor spending has continued to grow. A very unscientific query by me on a couple of doo preservation forms found that while the majority of people lamented the loss of the motels, they were still drawn to the island. The free beach, the boardwalk, amusement piers, and just the general atmosphere would continue to bring them back every season. So what happened and where did this historic preservation effort go wrong? While the loss of the culture resources, which made up the historic district through the continued demolition and condo conversion of the motels was the main reason, the failure to achieve a Wildwood Shore Resort Historic District was due to accumulation of multiple factors. The first is timing. The resurgence in popularity for the Wildwoods corresponded with a real estate boom, which wildly overinflated the market prices for property at a time when many motel owners were at or near retirement age and ready to get out of the business. Many motel owners did not fully understand the implications or lack thereof of being listed on the state and national register. Statements made during public meetings showed that many motel owners didn't grasp that such recognition was merely honorary and that any real regulatory teeth would only come with local designation. The apparent misunderstanding of what it meant to be listed suggests miscommunication between the parties involved. Whether this lack of information was due to uninformed rumors, not enough communication from the doo Preservation League and those pushing for the historic district, or just willful ignorance, is something that we'll never know. When the island retained over 300 motels, one could make the case that it was an amazing collection of mid-century motels found nowhere else in America. But as more and more owners sold or demolished their properties, the value of the collection as a whole began to fall, making it easier for other motel owners to follow suit and sell their properties to developers. Although our original survey included the full length of the island, by 2005, the boundaries of the historic district had been truncated to just a portion of Wildwood Crest. This seemed to create resentment from members of the Wildwood Crest community who thought that some kind of backdoor deal had been made with the leaders of the city of Wildwood and North Wildwood to avoid designation. The recent past is difficult to preserve and many people who experienced these motels growing up don't see them as particularly special or historic. Some people were fixed on stereotypes and felt that the motels were not emblematic of 1950s architecture and that any focus for preservation should be on buildings such as chrome plated diners and bowling alleys. For many, their concept of what is important to the history of America includes Paul Revere's home in Boston, not a collection of motels that told the story of how middle-class Americans spent their summer vacations. A number of the motels that were to be included in the historic district did not meet that 50 year threshold at the time of the nomination. And this lack of distance from history was difficult to overcome. Of the five free ocean beaches in New Jersey, three of them are Wildwood, North Wildwood and Wildwood Crest. Free beach admission, especially one with a boardwalk means there's no shortage of people wanting to vacation on the island. The Wildwoods also has multiple amusement piers and a water park, 
and therefore they didn't need to rely on heritage tourism to draw people to the town. While much of New Jersey tends to lean liberal or at least Democrat, the Wildwoods and much of South Jersey leans more conservative with Republicans outnumbering Democrats almost two to one. Many Republicans tend to be against what they consider to be government regulation and overreach. Historic preservation also surprisingly seen tends to be one of those issues that's more important to those at the center and left of the political spectrum. And finally, class. In the 1950s and 60s, South Jersey was a mecca for blue collar families and exotically themed motels such as the Waikiki, Kona Kai and Casa Bahama allowed a family who couldn't actually afford an island vacation to feel like they were somewhere more exciting. Blue collar and vernacular history is easy to dismiss by many, including other blue collar families. To them, it's just seen as normal life, not as a unique experience that wasn't enjoyed by all. They just don't see it as having value. Each of these motels has been demolished. And while the demolition and condo conversion of these motels may not have had an economic impact in the Wildwoods, it's still a major loss of vernacular architecture and American history, which are gone forever. In a conversation with Dan McElvery of the Duwap Preservation League, he mentioned that he felt that we had seen the end of motel demolition in Wildwood. He felt that those who were going to leave have left and those that remained are in it for the long haul. Today, about 100 Duwap motels remain in business and have been refurbished and upgraded. The city of Wildwood remains committed to the idea of Neo Duwap as a visitor attraction. Recent projects include the unveiling of a 25 foot tall fire hydrant, which will soon be joined by a large dog sculpture constructed from a recently dismantled roller coaster. And while visually interesting, these new structures and neon signage lack the authenticity that was found in those original motels. The importance of the Duwap motels both architecturally and culturally was recognized through the acceptance of the Motels of the Wildwoods multiple property submission in 2006. Yet, as of today, only two individual motels have been listed, the Chateau Blue and the Caribbean. Although there's no hope for the creation of a historic district, there remains a pathway for the designation of those remaining motels which truly embody the doo-wop aesthetic, such as the Pink Champagne, the Bel Air, the Panoramic, and the Jolly Roger. And fingers crossed that the doo-wop Preservation League is able to encourage the owners of these motels to work towards achieving designation for these amazing motels. Thank you. All right. That was fantastic, Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll stop sharing so you can. Uh... Sure. Great. All right. Great. Well, thank you. That was, I mean, some of the, the quotes you had there towards the end, the recent past is difficult to preserve. That's something that we find a lot um, yeah. preservation New Jersey. And I also loved the quote where you said, the bones remain, but the skin has been removed, right? That's, that certainly describes a lot yeah. of situations that we see. <laughs> So um, anyways, I want to open it up now um, after that this incredible presentation to our uh, attendees. If anybody has a question that they would like to ask, you can ask it in the chat and I can ask Stephanie or you can, you're welcome to turn, um, uh, turn yourself um, off mute and, uh, and ask it yourself. So please just, just um, jump in if you have any questions. And if you need me to unmute you, <laughs> let's see. But let's see. Okay, Jeff has a question in the chat. Okay. He says, adaptive reuse proposals for any of the doo-wop lodging structures. I guess uh, any examples of adaptive reuse proposals for any of the doo-wop lodging structures? I really think that their only adaptive reuse has just been converting them to condos. I don't know that they've, they've really looked at anything other than still keeping them as housing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it was a good example you showed of the of the condos. <laughs> it was, it was a very different. Yeah. <laughs> very sad. Very sad. Very different. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions or um, any comments? I can again let me know if I need to unmute you. I'm not sure. Just let me know in the chat how that works. I know I have just a couple questions. Oh, here. Okay, Taylor. Uh, right. Okay, so Taylor um, from Preserving the Wildwood says. Condo tells, condo tells, I like that, I hadn't heard that term, are good because they permanently preserve these buildings from demolition, but how do we encourage preservation of the themes and signage during conversion? 
that's something that's really hard um, simply because in order to get a bunch of people to stay, they've kind of made them very bland. And that's kind of how they're, that, that's basically really how they've marketed. And so I really don't have the answer on that. I mean, I would love to own a condo in a really cool 1950s motel, but um, you know, it's not going to happen because I don't have that kind of money. But also, you know, I just, so many of them when they're, I mean, look at the, the Singapore, it's just been completely stripped of anything that made it visually interesting. And now it's just, it's just a boring green building with French doors. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, I think something like that really has to come from the property owner. And I don't know that a lot of people are willing to kind of take that financial risk for something that's, you know, if they've seen, if they've seen the boringness working in other condo tales, I don't know that they have an impetus to really kind of make that kind of financial risk, mm -hmm. but nothing says you can't keep it. And then if it doesn't work, change it to a boring condo, but that's I'm like you. A chance. yeah, I prefer one. If I was going to buy a condo, <laughs> I think I'd love one with a theme. Um, and, and mm -hmm. one of the things that I noticed is um, the, the, the Society for Commercial Archaeology had another conference, I think, for their, their, their 25th um, anniversary. And so many of the it's it's completely different there. Like when it was a motel, there were people there every single night. And it didn't matter if it was a Thursday. There was still a ton of people around. But once they became condos, it's empty until Friday night. And it's completely changed, you know, just the feeling of being in downtown Wildwood on, on any kind of day. Mm. Uh, another question from Taylor here in the chat. Uh, she says, thank you for that answer. What bit of advice would you give to the newly revived preservation movement in the Wildwoods? Great question. Yep. And actually Taylor just recently won an award, our recent awards yes. for the work at preser preserving the Wildwoods and what they're trying to do to, to, to preserve the doo-wop architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really would love to see more of those motels get individually listed. Um, and then if they can also, you know, do some local designation too. Um, you know, people for kind of forget that the state and national register, it really, it has no teeth. It has, it's just like, yay. Um, I, and I think talking to the motel owners and really trying to get through to them what that means and how important these spaces are, um, I think is, is really that first step. Because in, in the end, it's really the motel owners who are going to be making that decision whether to strip everything off or keep everything awesome. So um, they're really the first people that you need to speak to and get them on board. Mm. And I thought we had done that in 2002. Um, but there was, you know, still a lot of them that just didn't understand what was going on. But hopefully the, I mean, hopefully Dan was right. Hopefully the ones that have left, have left and the ones that are stay are, are willing to get on board and keep it going. Right. And hopefully they're seeing the benefit like that. Hopefully they're thriving. You know, I certainly, I, I haven't stayed overnight in the wild, but I think I would love to stay in one that is creative and different and hopefully, so I'm, I'm curious if they're seeing the benefits of keeping those, those features. It would be really interesting to see the difference in like occupancy rates between the Caribbean, which is just visually amazing, and something that's kind of toned everything down and see is there a difference in their occupancy rates. And if, you know, if the, if the business community can kind of see that, you know, hey, this is a great way to make more, uh, you know, make a little more money. Mm -hmm. Have your rooms full. Exactly. Uh, turn on that no vacancy sign. Yes, so I, exactly. I see a question from Darren uh, Tobia in the chat. Um, does the historic preservation movement need to offer better economic incentives to compete with the offers from developers? Absolutely, 100%. It's, you know, it, and, and you see this in, in all aspects of historic preservation that, you know, again, if it's really only honorary, and you, in order to get any kind of tax credit, you have to do these really big things instead of just maintenance. Um, you know, it, it makes people kind of not get on board. But I think if, if, if maintenance money was provided as part of historic preservation, I think a lot of more people would be involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point that it's hard to keep up these structures. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so if, is there any more questions? And then if not, we're going to wrap up. Let's see, 
Okay, let me get our get our slide deck back up here. So Stephanie, I just want to say thank you. I mean, this was really, really amazing. I was like entranced. I never heard of phony colony. I learned a lot myself. Um, I don't know about other people, but it was really, really in depth and, um, and I appreciated it. So thank you again. And thank you Jablonski Building Conservation for being part of our building industry network and Stephanie for being so involved with us. Um, I want to just kind of go through here a little bit for folks that might be new to Preservation New Jersey. We are a statewide member supported organization uh, founded in 1978, and we're really focused on uh, historic preservation and, and, and its role in preserving, you know, the heritage, of course, the history and the stories, but also the economic vitality and sustainability of our state uh, it has such an important role to play there. We offer uh, memberships, building memberships, like I'm uh, business memberships, like I mentioned. We do our 10 most every year. Um, we have our uh, New Jersey Historic Preservation Awards, which we just held this past October, um, which were a great time to get back together in person. And we do a lot of virtual programming. Again, we kind of took a little break for some of the in-person things that we hosted. Um, we did a walking tour of Frenchtown. We did the awards. And now we'll be uh, doing some more virtual programming uh, through the winter with getting back into our tours in the spring. Um, we also, um, oops, I will also just welcome you to reach out to us if you have ideas for sessions for Q&A with PNJ. We really try to hear a lot of voices from throughout the state. Um, and so please, uh, please reach out if you have questions, ideas, uh, things that you'd like to us to get involved in. Um, we do talks. Uh, some of our board members go and, and connect with municipalities across the state. We're recently actually in the Wild Woods, not that long ago. Um, board members Barton Ross and Matt Pisarski talking about preservation uh, with the city council there. So please, again, just reach out. This is our contact information. Um, and just fun fact, there's Stephanie. <laughs> we didn't even plan that. So that's just how our slide deck looks. So um, with that, I'll stop our share please reach out. Uh, this is recorded. So if you missed any piece of it, we will be posting it on our Preservation New Jersey YouTube page um, and also on our website. So thank you again, Stephanie, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you. All Thanks, right. Emily. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>